but I think it's probably worthwhile now looking at UBI has actually been sort of on the cards in one form or another for goes back centuries. And I just thought we might spend a little bit of time just talking about um, what we might learn from what other countries have done and other experiments. And Greg, would you like to start that? Sure, I'm sure I'll start and then I think John and Gigi can, can kick in because there's a lot of activity going on at the moment. Obviously, um, we've got countries that are looking at this right now. Spain's just introduced, I think, um, a basic income. And uh, we've had experiments also in Finland that have ended recently, um, which was for 2,000 randomly selected unemployed people, giving the equivalent again of about $1,200 a month. Um, and a randomised controlled trial group that received no income. So in all of these studies, it's important to note, though, that they're not universal because it's not a natural experiment. Not everyone in the population gets it, right? They're very segmented, targeted populations where they're trying to monitor the work incentives, the health effects, education and participation. Um, in the developing world, there's been bigger studies, and obviously your money goes a lot further on a basic income study in places like India or Kenya. I mean, in those places, very transformative, right? So in the first year, yes, you see those same effects, but in year two and three, then you start to see that people get pooling their income. They buy sewing machines, they start sewing clothes. They pay off the, the, um, the debtor, so they're no longer in debt. Uh, they put fish in the dam and sell those at market. So there's a whole lot of kind of collective or societal dynamics that start to unfold in these quite remote um, villages, nonetheless. These are not urban settings but really quite interesting, not just individual effects, which is what we've been talking about, but what are the collective dynamics that start to get unleashed by this? So if we scaled it up, I think there's enough evidence to say that you could see some of these same effects, but again, it would depend on the kind of society uh, that you've got, the notions of what we think we owe each other, all of those things. But I think there's enough evidence um, to suggest that we, we could do it and not be too concerned about the particular effect on work, that we would see some health impacts positively, we would see people increase education, undertake uh, some care work. So I think the case for it on the, the trials that are run to date and are running at the moment would suggest that, you know, they're not reason to say no on the basis of right, the trials. Okay. Gigi, what so, do you draw from it? So I think there are, there's a very important distinction to be made between developing country and developed country UBI trials, and also the point that, that you made very well, Greg, which is that the trials that have run in the developed world, particularly the recent ones, really have not been universal basic income trials. They have been more like unconditional cash payments to our unemployed at the moment trials. Very different. <laughs> right? It's just very different. Um, and if you look at the evaluation of the, the finished trial, which ended and, you know, as you said recently, and wasn't actually renewed for funding. Um, it, it did have positive mental health effects, effects on the financial security, uh, self-perceived amongst the recipients, and, and a slight employment effect as well, so slightly more people going back to work. I think that was where your 0.5% figure came from. Um, but, you know, those are, those are, those are nice, <laughs> but the idea that one would then say, oh, on the basis of this result, of, of this evidence, we are going to now institute a, a, a universal, payment to everyone, not just the unemployed, right, um, and, and somehow garner, garner these, these massive benefits, that was something that the, the government there decided was not going to work, right? So the, so the evaluation of the trial indicated to me, and the fact that they didn't renew it indicated, okay, well, nice idea, but we don't really know how this is going to play out, you know, what benefits we're going to get if we extend this to the entire population. I think it's a nice idea for a nice heartwarming story, but it's not the solution to the development problem, and I also don't think it's the solution in the developed world if you're talking about a proper universal basic income. Now, I do think the positive results in terms of security, financial security and confidence even, in the finished trial are an interesting result and there may be some way that we could tweak our existing programs to provide more of that sort of thing, more security. And I actually like the idea of providing a, an, a mechanism through which the government can take onto its shoulders the downside risk of whatever might happen in the future. So you're offering a bit of help, a bit of encouragement without just breaking the bank and without making it such that the person is not expected to do anything to get this money. So much, again, wow. Um, I don't know which parts. I, I was about to uh, respond with we're in furious agreement and then I think we disagree and then we're in furious agreement again. I just can't remember to which points they were to. Uh, I think we all agree that um, in terms of how to interpret the evidence, the evidence doesn't tell us enough to be able to say yay or nay. I, I suspect we all agree on that. Um, the evidence from the developing countries 
don't help us much in a developed country. And uh, the evidence in developed countries, well, they're not evidence of a UBI as either of us imagine it. I think we can agree that we can't rule it in or out because of the evidence from the trials so far. Um, on your last point there, uh, it's, what do you say there, income contingent loans, perhaps we're going to be getting to something we can find agreement on. You, you planned this, didn't you? Um, Not at all. That also sounds very similar to uh, something known as a personal equity contracts, which I'm not sure if you've, either of you have heard of much before. A uh, passion of mine, I actually run a charity in Cambodia that arranges personal equity finance to give money to kids, or kids, university students, I still call them kids, um, using that sort of contract, that, that sort of system, like an income contingent loan. So I think we might be able to find some common ground there. It's often the case in public policy that it's the politics that trumps the evidence in many cases, and that's the real politic of public policy making. And as George Lakoff, you know, the cognitive scientist, would say, that's because partly frames matter more than facts. So we seek out the facts in the same way we're doing tonight about the sort of evidence we might glean from a trial about whether it's a good idea or not, right? But also to say that no one ever talks about this happening tomorrow if we're going to move to a universal-based income. We all accept that, like social justice, it's a kind of distant horizon that one's aiming at, and you would have to take small steps to get there. It's what some UBI advocates call a stepping stone approach. So you might start with young people who have a bumpy transition between school and work, or school and ed higher education, right? So you say, 20 to 24 year olds, let's have a basic income for those guys. Problem with that though is that politically, a lot of young people don't get that much support, right? But that is a group that suffers, as do mature age workers who are facing discrimination in the labour market. So you could start with some groups, um, but no one thinks we're gonna do it tomorrow. It's not a Nike commercial, of just do it, because it's, it's a complex thing to do. Yeah. Um, I suppose we've actually got it right at the moment as sort of a, a forced on us experiment in uh, a version of universal basic income with job uh, keeper program. And uh, it's changing by the day. It's costing $70 billion or so for six months. And I'm just wondering if the panel has yet drawn any conclusions or observations about what's happening in the real world at the moment. Just quickly, not job keeper, because Gigi might want to say something about that, but on job seeker, you know, ACOS did a study because of the additional supplement that people have got. Um, you know, that they're spending it on kind of essential utilities and they're generally spending it on the things that you would expect them to spend on, not frivolous items. And so it's hard to see, if we get to what the common ground is, that even if we don't have a universal payment, which we're not going to land on as a common ground tonight, but that new start won't go back to what it, what it was, right? Because poverty at that level is a disabling force. It doesn't enable or encourage people to get a job. Uh, they can't buy clothes, they can't buy bus tickets. That, that level at which Newstart was paid is a historical anomaly between the way in which we index pensions and index allowances. And it's also based historically on the idea that unemployment is a temporary phenomena. And since the 70s, that's not been the case. I hope that wasn't angling for the point of agreement because um, it, no, I, I think it was a mistake to double New Start. I don't think that addressed the underlying problem that's happening for coronavirus. And uh, I, anyway, and also, the, I guess the bigger point here is I don't think that echoes a UBI mm. in any way. Right. So uh, it, if you earn more, you are going to uh, receive less. And it doesn't go to everyone without conditionality. Indeed, we had, didn't really get to it now, but the conditionality of welfare is a big sticking point that has several points, both on the for and the against side. Uh, I think on balance, the for side can win, but it's... Um, we didn't really get to much discussion of that here, but the job seeker is not unconditional. So, I mean, my, my wife doesn't get it. I don't well, get except it. Well, except they <laughs> suspended the conditions during the payment period up until um, they've only started to phase them back in, right? So, yes, normally Newstart has a whole lot of conditions attached, um, but for the moment they've suspended those conditions. On, on JobKeeper, I actually think that the, the most attractive element of that program was that it kept together people who were already in a job and the employers, right, rather than simply giving money to whoever happened to not be in a job at the time. And so that, that, that lack of severing that link, I think, is what is going to have helped the most through this horror period and will hopefully be able to, to, to get us out of the recession a little bit more quickly. Of course, the longer the lockdowns and the, and the craziness happen, you know, the less likely that that particular job is going to be needed on the other side of the uh, of, of the crisis, and so you know that person may not be taken up in, in job again. But it was certainly a good idea at the time to keep together those employers and employees, and that's actually the networking that we were talking about earlier. This idea that you know it's actually the connection into the labour market that a lot of people who don't have a job really need help with. 
right? Not just money, not just a handout, but you know, how do I fish, right? And and that was basically saying, okay, I'm going to keep you holding this fishing rod, <laughs> right? For a little while, anyway, and then hopefully on the other side of this, you can keep fishing. And so I liked that aspect of the program a lot. In terms of what to expect on Thursday's announcement, I do expect the government will. Um, start to target the program more because the, the biggest feature of this, of course, was the blanket policy. As you said, $1,500 a fortnight, no matter what your wage was. If it was a lot less, you get that amount. And if it was a lot more, you still get that amount. And I think they'll target it probably on the basis of industry. We know certain industries have been very heavily affected. I think they'll probably also change the payment and arrears aspect of it because that's been uh, heavily criticized by the employer groups. Um, but I think there, there's no way that they're going to let people just fall off a cliff at the end of September. Sorry, there may be a bit of cross-purpose here. The, the job keeper one, I agree that made sense. Um, the job seeker one, those people are already getting new starts and they're already living on new starts, so doubling their new start didn't address the problem being caused by COVID, which was new people losing their jobs. Uh, and the 1500, uh, that wasn't what I was referring to when I was saying that uh, the, the top up for job keeper, because there was also a top up for job keeper, uh, which you do lose as you earn more income, which is the whole point of not being a UBI. So it wasn't a UBI, it was a top up of welfare, temporary. Um, and I've got to say also the making it easier to get job seeker in the midst of this crisis also made sense to me. So I'm not purely evil. <laughs>